Hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing well today. Um, I got everybody that has handed in a current event uh, graded so far. So your next current event is due today, tonight at midnight. Uh, so let's get those in. And uh, if you have any questions, give me a, a holler. I also started doing some of the uh, uh, worksheets for you. So hopefully I'll have those all graded. Everybody will have something graded by uh, next Sunday so you know uh, what to do in there. Okay, I'll get them... I'm working on a hard try my best. Okay, folks. Um, so this is for chapter three. Um, in there, when you go to, uh, you'll see when I, you load this up, uh, you'll see there's another video called Is the Insect Apocalypse Real? And I want you guys to give this little uh, a, a video a watch. Um, it's nine minutes long. It's pretty good because it talks about, you know, the uh, loss of biodiversity in the insect world that we're talking about here in, in this chapter. Uh, but it also talks about how uh, the scientific method behind how they do this experiment. And it's pretty neat because it goes through the kind of the steps of the scientific method and sets up a control and all this other stuff to actually calculate and collect the data. So it also shows how to set up an experiment. All right. So it's a really good video. So please give that a call, uh, a view, and it's right underneath the link for this uh, this uh, video. All right. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, let us get into chapter three here um, for this section. So, all right, chapter three. Well, in this chapter, we're going to talk about natural selection. All right. Ooh, what happened there? Sorry, guys. Uh, natural selection, how evolution influences biodiversity. I'm going to talk about reasons as for species extinction. All right. Uh, levels of eco ecological organization. So these are some pertinent terms we'll need to know for the tests and stuff like that. Population characteristics. Uh, we'll talk about logistic growth, limiting factors, carrying capacity, and other concepts for population ecology. And this is very important stuff right here, especially carrying capacity. And it all goes along with the ecological footprint, too, that you do on your homework assignments. So challenging uh, and challenges and current efforts for conserving biology. So we we'll want to talk about how we can uh, take some steps to help uh, save some of these things that are going extinct. So the central case study for this chapter was Hawaiian geographic. It was in Hawaii, okay? And it talks about the geographic isolation in the middle of the Pacific. So there's nothing really around. It's almost a closed system. You know, we have some stuff drifting in the ocean, getting over there, and, you know, the wind and stuff like that. But it's basically a closed little island, all right? And half the native bird species have gone extinct since the 18th century. And this is primarily due to human influences. So we're going to talk about... Uh, why people go extinct, and a lot of times it is because of human influences, but there's other things, um, you know, secondary. We we influence things, but what happened in um, some of the countries is that we brought in, uh, we influenced the ability for tree snakes to get onto the islands and eat all the birds, all right? So it wasn't really our fault, but we're the ones that let the snakes on the islands to begin with. So the acad is one of the 18 living species in Hawaiian or a Hawaiian heap honey creeper uh, genus of birds. Um, and it diverged from a single ancestral species that reached Hawaii millions of years ago. So these animals get there without even us, all right? Um, each species has been has its own unique characteristics, such as a bill shape, all right? And these different bills, a lot of them eat different things, and that's how they get their ecological niche and survive, we'll learn later on in this chapter. So the lichen has a dis distinct curved bill that is used to get nectar from similar shaped flowers. So there's long tubing flowers that are able to get the uh, uh, bill out. Um, and Hawaiian's forests under siege due to clear cutting and non-native species introduced by the Polynesians and the earliest scepter, uh, settlers. So it's a double whammy. We've taken away the places where the birds can get their food and where they could shelter, all right, due to uh, population growth and habitat destruction, all right? And then also we've had uh, other evasive species that are predators for these birds, a.k.a. the tree snakes that are eating the eggs, all right? So it's a double whammy on them, okay? 
Um, a species is defined as a classification of organisms whose members can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. This is very important understanding what a species is. If you cannot produce fertile offspring, you're not a species. For example, um, there's what's called the mule, right? Um, everybody's heard of them. That's a, that is a combination between a horse and a donkey. All right. So a long time ago, man said, hey, this horse, really gentle. We can work with him. He allows us to do a lot of different things. Um, but it's not as strong as this, this donkey right here. But the problem with the donkey is, you know, it has a nickname called jackass because it doesn't want to, it's ornery. It doesn't want to listen. And someone said, hey, what happens if we breed this? They both got four legs. We breed this horse with this jackass over here. Maybe we'll get a really strong, docile and, you know, amenable uh, breed. And lo and behold, we have the mule. But the problem with the mule was that they cannot produce fertile offspring, so they're not considered a species. Inside the species, we have what's called a population. And a population is a group of individuals within that species. So you count up all the number of species, and that is the population. Populations change over multiple generations, okay? And they have uh, genetic changes to the physical and behavior characteristics, and this is called evolution. So every once in a while, there'll be a change in a uh, mutation in the genes that gives that species a advantage in the ecosystem, and that species is passed on more and more and finally takes over with inside the, the population there. Okay, but it usually has to be a beneficial uh, change. If it's not beneficial, those species, if it's not a beneficial change, that species will not survive and be able to pass on those traits. So evolution is driven by natural selection. All right, if we let Mother Nature do it. So it's a process that favors certain inherited characteristics over others, causing them to pass on more frequently. And this is not, you know, people think about natural selection, they always think about the strongest of the survival of the fittest, right? But it's not that fittest is about strength necessarily. It's about being able to fit into the environment. That's the key. So that natural selection, that, that mutation in the genes gave that species a better opportunity to fit into the environment, hence carrying on that gene further and further. All right. So the idea of natural selection is based on three observations. Okay. And you too can make these observations. Organisms face constant struggle to survive and reproduce. Okay. And this is kind of the, the survival of the fittest, all right? If you're going to have an advantage, you're going to be able to, to survive and reproduce more, okay? Due to your genetic mutation that, that was offered in that change. Organisms tend to produce more offspring. They can survive to maturity, all right? So we pump out more babies than uh, can make, that typically make it. And this is even for us humans. Um, individuals are species of a species vary in their attributes. So every individual is a little bit different, right? And that's what makes up our DNA. Everybody has a little bit different look, okay? Except for maybe identical twins, but even then there's maybe a little bit of difference in them, depending on how they were. Uh, there might be a little bit of difference. I don't know, I don't think so. So that's another here and there. So attributes are passed on from parent to offspring through genes. So genes that are leading uh, better uh, lead to better reproductive success will eventually evolve through the entire population. So if you have a gene that uh, allows you to survive and uh, live a little bit longer, that gene will be able to be reproduced more often. And the concept of natural selection started with uh, Charles Darwin, okay? Uh, way back when in 1850, all right? So working knowledge of evolutionary process has enabled us to uh, do a lot of different things, okay? We've been selectively breeding livestock for a long, long time. You can, you know, see that in the Bible. They talk about separating the black sheep and the white sheep so they can have some white wool and some black wool, all right? That's no big deal. We've been doing that for since we started the agricultural revolution. Um, we also have found out uh, through the natural process how to avoid antibiotic resistant uh, livestock, meaning that um, they are going to um, be able to fight off 
things better instead of just giving them antibiotics. There's a special gene in them that prevents a certain disease. So we pull that cow out from that livestock and breed that one only, trying to keep that gene there instead of having to feed them the antibiotics. Um, we avoid pesticide resistance, crop eating insects, all right? And to determine how infectious disease spread or gain or lose potency, all right? And we've seen this with the COVID, right? So we learned how that thing has actually mutated a little bit different and it has gained and sometimes lost its potency against us in the different variants from South Africa and Europe. And I think there's another one in California, maybe, all right? Um, but it happens all the time, especially in infectious diseases. It's really easy to mutate. These mutations in that, like a livestock take a little bit longer due to the life cycle. The life cycle of a cow is, you know, 20 years, whereas the bacteria is changing, you know, living for a couple months or the virus is living for a couple months and it's gone. But it has so many, it replicates so many times that it's one of those billions of times it's replicating your body, there's going to be a mutation in the gene. So accidents changes. Uh, accidental changes in DNA are called mutations, all right? It's not really a bad word, just the way it happens. And all mutations give rise to genetic variations in individuals, right? Some mutations are advantageous and some mutations are not muta not uh, advantageous. And the ones that, you know, hurt us usually don't get passed on, okay? Mixing the genetic material uh, through sexual reproduction also generates variation. So it's important to keep the genes mixed up. I don't know if you guys ever followed any of the old... Uh, uh, kingdoms and queendoms way back when, but there was a lot of times where their uh, family members interbreeded, all right? So the uncles were marrying the aunts and the sisters were marrying the brothers and that didn't get the genes all mixed up and that family genetic code, uh, something happened and it was passed on, uh, a bad thing was passed on. I think the, uh, uh, let's see, the people in uh, Dracula, I can't remember that country, um, was uh, where they had that bleeding, where they would cut themselves and they would keep on bleeding and they couldn't stop the blood uh, from not bleeding. That gene was passed on throughout the family, all right, until finally um, that family chain died off or we stopped it being kingdoms, all right? Um, so closely related species that live in different environments tend to diverge uh, in their traits. So different selective pressures lead to different ad adaptations in certain individuals and a population will survive or reproduce. So you see all these different birds, but depending on where they w live um, depends on uh, how they're going to adapt. So this one became a generalist, getting a little bit of everything. All right. This one specialized, ended up specializing because there's a lot of leaves around. So it forages among the leaves. This one were bark pickers. All right. This one became seed and fruit eaters. All right. And always and they can, became nectivores. So it always depends on where you live, where that species is living. Okay. Like that one bird in the, in the case study uh, ended up on um, Hawaii and they became nectivores because that's where they got the, they, got the nectar and their bill their beak was had a mutation that allowed them to get that nectar out of the uh, flowers a little bit easier unrelated species living in similar environments may independently acquire similar traits and this is called convergent evolution so the, you know these two cactuses never really in ran a bread but they look kind of the same all right but one is in the canary islands and one is in arizona all right but they still have the similar traits, and that's due to the environment and being able to, the environment was similar. So to be able to get what they needed out of the environment, they kind of have the similar traits, but they're not of the same species, okay? So they couldn't interbreed together. Um, humans have conducted selective, uh, conducted selection under their own conditions called artificial selection. And we've been doing this a long, 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 long time. Like I said, it's talked about in the Bible, but you see this with domesticated dogs and cats and livestock uh, trying to get, you know, came from a wolf and all of a sudden we have the Chihuahua, all right, uh, the Great Dane, the Collie. So we selected to breed these animals to do what we like to see or even the plants, all right. So, you know, cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all started from this little weed right here, all right, and we took out the different traits and, and, and selected breeded those seeds uh, to get what we want. 
So biodiversity or biological diversity refers to the variety of life across all levels, species, genes, populations, and communities. So biodiversity is everything we got out there, the different species, genes, populations, and communities. And biodiversity is really uh, the key to sustainability because biodiversity equals what I what I call biodiversity equals resilience, which equals sustainability. Because the more stuff we have, if there's a disaster that happens, the better chances we're going to have life continue. And whether or not that life is us, uh, I can't tell you. Um, but just like when the dinosaurs went extinct, the mammals will be able, were able to uprise and become the dominant species on the or dominant species on the on the planet okay about 1.8 million species have been identified but there's probably about three or 100 million more we don't know especially in the oceans um the process in which a new species is generated is called specification all right so that over that time something becomes a new species that's called speciesification Allotropic specification occurs when populations become physically separated. So they could be in the same area, all right? Uh, this is a little, little bug right here, all right? And they lived in the same little forest, and sooner or later, uh, the land mass is separated over millions of years, and these two uh, could never no longer intertwine, and they became two different species over the thousands of years. And, you know, this might seem kind of strange. These are just little bugs. But this actually happened here recently in North America. The bats were having this nose little fungus, all right? And it was killing them off, and it still is, all right? And, but we noticed that the bats over in Europe did not uh, succumb to this nose virus. So we said, hey, maybe we can take the bats from Europe and get them on with the bats in North America and they can pass that gene that protects them from this fungus to the bats in North America and everything's going to be safe, right? But all of a sudden, we mixed them together and we realized that they weren't the same species because they could not have live fertile offspring, all right, between the two of them. So, you know, that's, you know, something we just realized. You would think that a bat from Europe would be able to, uh, to um, have live fertile offspring with a bat from North America, but hey, they have been allop. Patrick separation specification because of the Atlantic Ocean in between them. Scientists represent the history of divergence with from paleogenic trees, and so we just go all the way down the, the line of uh, specification throughout the time, right? And we looked at this through uh, different fossils and things like that, right? So we find this, the you know, we, we call this taxonometry all right so the different families and genuses and stuff like that throughout the uh the community okay and we look at this you know through the fossils right and the fossil is just an imprint of the stone and the dead organisms and date back in the rock layers all right so we look at the different fossil records and see how these animals have changed over time over the millions of years okay but you realize when we look through this fat, this fossil record, we see a vast majority of the species that once lived have disappeared due to what's called extinction. So a lot of the animals, about 99% of the animals that have ever lived here on Earth are no longer around. All right? They've changed into a new species or just have died off because the uh, environment changed on them. So extinction occurs when an environment changes more rapidly than the species can adapt. Okay, A small and narrowly Specialized populations are the most vulnerable. So if that population um, uh, is you know, specific, like the, the panda bear is specific, it eats only bamboo. And if that bamboo disappears, so is the panda, all right? Or in Hawaii, native birds and plants did not evolve defenses against the mammal uh, predators that were brought on to the, uh, to the island, all right? Most extinctions happen gradually. And then that rate is called the background extinction rate, all right? And, you know, it happens naturally throughout all of, all of, all of time. Um, the Earth has seen at least five mass extinction events that are wiped out about 50 to 95% of the Earth species each time, all right? 
So each time we've had these, we've had a, seen a large decrease in the biodiversity on the planet, right? The most, contra most contra catastrophic was the Permian extinction about 250 million years ago, and that's when the dinosaurs, the, the comet came down and hit the Yucatan Peninsula and blew, blew that up, put all the stuff in the air and uh, covered out the sunlight, and there was no plant matter, and most of the dinosaurs were actually plant eaters, right? And they didn't have enough food and sunlight, uh, and food because the plants didn't have enough sunlight, and it was just, uh, you know, the mammals took over. All right. But it was also different things that happened there. It was volcanism and uh, that happened during that time as well. So there's, it was a kind of like a double whammy effect of changing the environment, and the dinosaurs could not adapt fast enough. Okay. Today's extinction rate, when we look at it, all right, when we count up all the animals that are around and uh, what are dying off, is about a hundred to a thousand times higher than the background rate, and it is rising faster, okay? And these things are caused from human, uh, these causes causes stem from human population growth, okay? And we look at it, we say, okay, uh, well, altering the, and destroying the natural habitats by, you know, instead of having the points, uh, Pittsburgh being all forest, it's now a city, all right? Also over harvesting or over hunting, we're pulling out more fish out of the sea, um, then they can reproduce, right? Also, pollution of the air and water and soil is also hurting these animals. Okay, we can't we can't put a sign "Do not drink" um, because they're not going to be able. Deer can't read, right? Uh, also, the introduction of non-native species or invasive species into the environment, just like the uh, tree snake in in the Canary Islands that tree snakes got on there and now they have no birds whatsoever okay um and also climate change and climate change is actually being added to this list uh due to temperature changes all right so there's a lot of things that are going to happen in climate change that's another variable um with inside why the mass extinction is happening right now what is called the mass extinction Ecology and organisms. So ecology is the study of interactions between, um, among organisms and their environments. It includes on many levels. So an organism is just one single living thing. A population is a group of individuals of the same species that live in an area. Okay. Then we got the community, all right, which includes all the populations. So we have the species. All right, then we got the populations of that species. Then we got the community that has all the populations, all the different species inside of it, okay? And then we got the ecosystem, which includes communities of all abiotic and non-living parts of the environment. <coughs> so, excuse me. So the ecosystem includes all the energy flows and nutrients, all the lead and uh, mercury and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus with inside the area as well. Okay, so we got the species, which is anything that I can uh, have for produce fertile live offspring. All right, and then when we count up all those fertile live offspring, we get what's called the population of that certain species. Then we put all the populations together, we get the community. And then we throw in all the other stuff that's non-living too. We get the ecosystem. So a biosphere is the sum total of all living things and inhabitants of the earth. So we live in the biosphere. And landscape ecology examines how these ecosystems and communities and populations are distributed across the earth. So that's what they use GIS for kind of okay they get these big old maps and they do little blocks and stuff of where um how things are different around um the earth so it's a little bit different in i guess this may be africa i don't know what the heck this is north america um than in africa right different in the oceans uh different in the different landscapes and you got to define your little areas and then you put those little areas together and that becomes landscape ecology and how they mix and max together so each organism has a relationship in its habitat, in the environment in which it lives, right? Um, 
and it can live on the rocks, the soil, the leaf litter, plant life, etc. Depending on the species, a habitat may be a square meter of soil or many miles of land, right? So you got the elephants that go over acres and miles and miles of land, but you have a worm that lives in one little area, okay? So you got to define your little, your area first to define the carrying capacity and things like that, the ecological footprint, all that stuff. So organisms thrive in certain habitats and not in others, creating patterns of habitat use. Okay, mobile organisms can choose where they want to live, right? We can get up and move wherever we want to. You can pick your family. You can't pick your family, but you can pick where you live. And this is called habitat selection. An organism's role in that community is called its niche. So what does it do? And I'm still trying to figure out uh, humanity's ecological niche, all right? Um, but a niche just includes the resources and interactions with other an, uh, organisms. So, you know, we like to burn our carbon, right? So the ecological niche in, for the panda bear will be to eat that bamboo, okay? Species with marrow riches is called specialists, like the, the panda bear, all right? Um, it's our, if something happens is to that bamboo or, you know, something, it's going to be harder for them to be able to bounce back. And they, they are succumb to extinction much faster than someone who is a generalist, like a black bear who can eat the berries and the rabbits and all this other stuff. Okay. And they are called generalists. So population size, the number of organisms in the area at any given time will grow when the resources are abundant and natural enemies are few. Um, Declines are caused by resource loss and natural disasters or impacts from the species. The North American pe passenger pigeon decline went to uh, went extinct due to overhunting. So this was a very uh, sad story. I mean, we used to have these little passenger pigeons that were all over the world. I mean, they were crazy. We used to go out and just take pot shots at them all the time and ended up uh, killing off the whole population Okay, due to overharvesting. Population density describes the number of individuals in a per, per square unit, all right? And then you have population distribution, uh, which talks about how they are spread around the landscape, all right? So you have the population density. So we look in here and you see this is a random, all right? And we see how much population's in each one of these little random areas. And this little area will be the density, okay? Then you have some that are uniform, all right? You see these penguins over here, they kind of line up in nice little single rows, all right? And then you have clumped together in little pastures, okay? And we see this way Mother Nature designs a lot of different things, okay? So the sex ratio is a portion of male to female. It's typically, typically a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, when seen in monogamous species, ratios vary in others, all right? But it's typically about one-to-one -one ratio. The age structure describes the number of individuals in different ages with, within a population. Um, this can help predict whether a population will grow or shrink in the near future. So if you don't have a lot of offspring in the, in the beginning, the population isn't going to grow as large if you had a large offspring. Population changes uh, change is determined by four different factors. All right? Births within the population deaths within the population, arrival of individuals from outside the population, and departation, departation of individuals from that population, all right? So we got births plus deaths, births minus deaths plus immigration minus immigration, okay? And that gives us the population rate of natural increase is determined by just subtracting the birth date from the uh, death rate from the birth rate. So a lot of times when you see um, the population growth rate of a nation, it's going to include this immigration in immigration, all right? So you'll see that the United States population growth rate is actually positive. I think it's about 1.7 or something like that percent. Uh, growth rate in the United States. But if you just look at the population rate of natural increase of just the deaths minus the births and take out this immigration and immigration, you would see that we were actually at a negative uh, growth rate. So if it wasn't for all the immigration 
to the United States, our population would population number here in the United States would be going down. And this is the same for a lot of the industrialized nations, Europe, uh, China, or not China, Europe, and uh, Japan, and Australia. Um, the, long, the, the more established, developed nations are almost all seeing a negative, uh, natural increase of population. All right? Um, so, if it wasn't for the immigration, they wouldn't be growing either. Okay? So, the actual population growth includes the effects of the immigration and immig immigration immigration. This is what you're going to get from the, the, the government. All right? But rates may be expressed in per thousand individuals. Um, these can be used in formula. So, growth rates may be expressed as a percentage of population growth rate. Population growth rate times 100%. So when a population increases by a fixed percentage each year, it is called exponential growth. And when you graph it, it just goes up like this, all right? The J-curve. Um, you've probably seen the J-curve, especially with the COVID, right? So we saw the COVID go straight on up, all right, when it first came out. And that was an exponential growth. And that was a scary time for all of us. But eventually, what we'll see happen is that everything will just go over to and uh, turn into what's called an S-curve, the stabilization of population size. So we saw, we want this, and eventually, what will happen here is it will turn into a, a, a bell curve, and finally, all these pigeons would fall, would die off, and hopefully that will happen with COVID as well, okay? But eventually, every population is constrained to its physical, chemical, and biological limiting factors, okay? There has to be enough water for all these birds, enough food, and all that stuff. And sooner or later, we'll get up to that certain population size where we'll just turn into this S-curve, and that population will stabilize, okay? Population grows as it reaches its what's called carrying capacity, okay? And this is, produces S-shaped a curve called logistic growth. So this is what we see every time in the United States, in the Mother Nature, and you, you'll see the uh, population growth curve for you, for humans is just like this J curve. But I think we're in the time where um, the population growth of humanity is actually going to be turning into this S curve. We're going to have to level out, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the population section. So Eurasia, collared dove, is a non-native species that reached the carrying capacity of Florida, where it was introduced. All right, so this bird came into the carrying capacity of Florida, and sooner or later, I had to go seek out other habitats, all right? And its population grew slowly or exponentially, depending on how recently it arrived. So when I got here, you know, every time it got to a new um, area in the United States, you would see the J-curve, and then sooner or later, that J-curve would turn over into an S-curve, okay? Limiting factors restrain the growth. So the density of the population can enhance the dimin or diminish the effects of some limiting factors. So there's two different density factors. So there's density-dependent factors, which rise and fall with the population density. So if you're going to have more of the population that has predators, predation, the more you'll have, the more predators you bring in. All right? But also if things are packed together, you're going to have more diseases going between that species. Just like when you're, you know, um, come back from spring break and everybody's in the dorms and everybody gets strep throat. Okay? That is because you're in a smaller place. Okay? Or more dent packed in. There's also what's called density independent factors, which are infected by population density. And these are like extreme temperatures, catastrophic natural disasters or something, something outside control of the population. This is an outside event um, that's, you know, like a natural disaster. Okay. A capricious act of nature. So carrying capacity can vary as environments and species are complex and ever changes. So carrying capacity is never really a fixed item, all right? It will fluctuate as, you know, it will fluctuate de depending on environmental conditions. If, for instance, a fire destroys a forest, the carrying capacity is almost, for most animals, will decrease, all right? 
By learning what to build shelters and control fires, humans eased the limiting factors of cold environments, increased the planet's carrying capacity for us, right? So we used our technology to be able to build shelters so we can live in places that we would not be able to live in before, okay? Human development and resource extraction are spending on the natural rate of environmental change that affects populations. So one example is the introduction of species which displaced or killed native species. And this is called, uh, these are called evasive species, okay? So a wide variety of organizations uh, work to protect the lands and remove these evasive species to restore their natural habitat. But this is really, really hard to do. Okay, well, we still have to try. The efforts um, can create economic benefits as benefit visitors are drawn to the wildlife and natural air, e uh, areas called ecotourism. Um, Hawaii uh, economics takes about 12 billion annually for more than 7 million visitors per year. All right, so having a wide variety of organizations. Uh, these organizations try to protect the land. What they're trying to do is what one thing is called ecotourism. So to preserve the uh, coral reefs in Hawaii, they try to bring in people to go uh, scuba diving. Africa does this a lot. They you know, bring in people to give tours to Savannah and things like that. So it's a big money maker. I really like ecotourism as an um, economic advantage. Okay. Now, climate change poses a challenge. Um, so as these temperatures and rainfall patterns change, uh, even protective areas uh, may be affected. So we're trying to, you know, do this ecotourism for the coral reefs, but as the temperatures in the ocean changes, that's causing uh, uh, a what's called the bleaching of the coral. So no one's going to come just to see these white corals, right? It's not beautiful anymore, right? And there's nothing we can really do about that, um, no matter how much ecotourism we do. Okay, so there's a lot of different things that we need to uh, try to work at as it comes to climate change. And we'll talk about it a little bit more in the climate change section. All right. But scientists and managers will need to come up with a few new ways to save some of these declining populations, such as the coral reefs. Okay. All right. So that is chapter three. Okay. So don't forget you have a current event that's due every Wednesday. And then um, I'll get you out the uh, second. Uh, chapter four here um, shortly, probably on tomorrow or later on today. Okay. Thanks everybody. If you have any questions, please give me an email.